could you open uh, could you open the schedule now schedule that i shared huh? schedule uh, good afternoon everybody dear audience uh, thank you very much for joining uh, today's uh, session, technical session. Uh, today, uh, the session is uh, TC22, and the title is Measures. Could you put it down? The, uh, down the, uh, measures to reduce earthquake disaster risk, the experience of Asian countries. So this uh, 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 seminar, uh, that will be moderated by uh, Muhammad Abdul Malik Shikdar, fellow IEB Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, without any uh, talk, uh, now I would like to uh, request uh, Honorable Session Chair, uh, Mr. Abdul Malik Shikdar, fellow IEB, to, uh, to uh, uh, continue this session. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. And I welcome you all to today's session on behalf of TC22. Uh, we will have four presentations today. And the one presentation from Pakistan, IEP, one from JSC, and one from PIC, and one from IEB. So our uh, first presentation will be from on behalf of IEP, and the presentation will be by Professor Sharosh Lodhi, who is Vice Chancellor of NED University, Pakistan. I'll request Professor Lodhi to present his paper. Thank you, sir. Thank so you. The yeah, I'll, I'll try to finish it quicker. Can I have the clicker, please? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, can I have my presentation, please? Can I have my presentation, please? Now, while they are preparing the presentation, I must thank my colleague from IEB, uh, Mr. Sigdar for taking all the trouble and uh, he has been pushing all of us to participate in a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, topic of earthquake seismic uh, uh, risk reduction in our respective countries. And when I look around uh, the 17 countries, I think almost everybody has this problem. Probably, you know, Japan, uh, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Nepal, Pakistan, probably of all the countries that they're in, Bangladesh has the last, the least seismic risk, and yes, yet they're taking a lot of effort. So uh, I would request all of you, especially United States and Japan, uh, Japan is participating anyway, and the Korea, to kindly take more <laughs> active participation in this, in this, t in this TC22. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about this uh, the small one-room apartment that we retrofitted at NED University, and uh, yeah, so how do you anyway? So I mean, just a very quick. Uh, uh, you know, things about Pakistan, you see this blue line, this is where the interplate boundary crosses the country, half of the country lives in Indonesian plate, uh, Eurasian plate, and half of the country lives in the, uh, the, uh, the Indian tectonic plate, and this is where River Indus also flows. And because of the water, 75% of the popula population lives around the interplate boundary. So the seismic risk uh, is very, very high because of the interplate boundary that crisscross through the country. I don't know. It's not. Ah, okay. Yeah. 
can you can you run it for me, please? Otherwise, uh, I'll be struggling continuously. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Can I have the the next the next one, please? The next slide. Yeah. So this gives you an overall picture from in, in 1900 to 2005 that what kind of different disasters has been hitting uh, the region where, where, where I live. And you can see here that the earthquake, even though we only had 26 events uh, in last uh, uh, 1,000 years, a little more than 1,000 years, but the casualties are about 150,000 people died, even though we have extreme weather events, drought, epidemics, floods, uh, landslides, and storms. but. Uh, the, the, the casualties from earthquakes is obviously very large. Next, please. Uh, so this is more recent for the last 11 years from 2005 to this 2016. We had a massive earthquake uh, of uh, uh, 7.6 magnitude, a shallow earthquake in the northern part of the country and 73,000 people died. Uh, but then uh, floods are very frequent, and especially after, the after this climate change is taking place, we are having floods almost every other year. We had massive floods in 2010, 2011, 2020, 2022. So, you know, flooding is more frequent. And so are the droughts in some part of the countries. Next, please. Now, if I look at the building typology, I've taken two building census data, one in 1997, followed by the recent one in 2017. And you can see the different kind of building typologies that exist in Pakistan. In 2017, if you look at reinforced concrete, which is approximately 8%, and, I and God knows how many of them were engineered. The rest of the 92% are for sure non-engineered construction, whether it is adobe or brick or block or timber, no engineering input. Then after the 2005 earthquake, uh, the building control became a little stronger in the country. And now that the, the building typology has improved, so uh, uh, about 24% of the buildings are now reinforced concrete, yet it's Three quarters of the, the country still doesn't have any engineering input in the built environment, and yet that's why it is fragile. Next, please. Uh, and these are the seven different typologies that we have broadly categorized these, these things are reinforced concrete, block masonry, brick masonry, wooden and, and stone masonry, and adobe or uh, earthen structures, and, and the structures which are neither here nor there. Next, please. And uh, once again, the recent history of earthquake from, uh, from uh, uh, 1905 to the one th in 2015, and you can see here that they're all big earthquakes, and they have created havoc in the country. Especially the 2005 earthquake uh, was the most uh, uh, damaging, where 73,000 people died, but most of the earthquakes uh, have caused, caused casualty, most of the earthquakes took place in the province of Balochistan, which is the western province, and that is sparsely populated. That's why the casualties are a little lesser. Had it been in another part of the country, God knows how many people have died. Next, please. Uh, the one that I've been talking about, the Kashmir earthquake, we call it Kashmir earthquake in 2005. It completely destroyed some part of Kashmir and uh, a very uh, recently designed building in Islamabad also collapsed and this has caused uh, up nearly 2.8 million people who were rendered homeless. Uh, 450,000 buildings were completely damaged, and you can imagine the challenge that the country had to go through. Next, please. Uh, these are the images, some of the damages that took place during these earthquakes. So, uh, next, please, Judge. Can I have the next slide? Yeah. So you can see that all sorts of buildings underwent damage, whether it is bridges or buildings or houses or adobe houses, you know, uh, because of the s extensive shaking that took place uh, in the country. And apart from extensive shaking, the buildings are so fragile. No engineering input. So when there is no engineering input, you can expect these kind of things happening. And unfortunately, when I look out around the region, the entire region, I don't see any different story, whether it is Bangladesh or India or Nepal or, or most of the most of the, the countries. I don't know about uh, Indonesia, but I won't be surprised uh, if it is any if, if, if it is any different. Next, please. So what we did, we took a, 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 a one third scale of a typical house in Pakistan, which is made out of adobe, and then seismically retrofitted the walls. Uh, uh, the, v, the, the edges of the walls were connected together by a wire mesh, which was plastered. And similarly, we have done the same thing at the top of the, the building so that the whole 
thing doesn't act like four separate, four separate walls, rather than it acts like a wall which increases the stiffness in the moment of inertia. As a result, the seismic resilience increased. Next, please. Uh, so this is the typical uh, house that you can see on the left-hand side. You can see the wire meshes placed there wherever there is opening or, or the spindle beam at the top. And then this is the actual house, which is the one-third scale of a regular house. And then it was subjected to, next please. It was subjected to the intense ground shaking. We used Adobe, uh, Kobe, next please. We used Kobe earthquake record uh, for uh, for our testing, and we obviously tested, uh, put the ground shaking from 20% uh, of Adobe, uh, sorry, Kobe earthquake to 475% of Adobe. So see, to see what is the seismic performance of the building here. Uh, so at the top on the right-hand side, the blue is giving you the ground acceleration, and the one at the bottom is giving you the ground displacements. Similarly, the response spectra uh, and the UBC 97 response spectrum is also provided there. Next, please. And what we, uh, can you run this uh, video, please? This is a video, can you run it for me? This is 450. How can it be? Can you, no, it's not playing? All right, that saves us time then. Can you try the next slide, please? Hope this works. It's not working yet. No. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, uh, but uh, it was working on my laptop. It's probably something happened while I was copying it, but I will make sure that I put these slides uh, on the website that we intend to 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 uh, develop. We'll, I'll talk about that thing in a while. But however, we were we subjected these buildings to the very extensive ground shaking using Kobe. Uh, 1995 earthquake as the base earthquake. And up to 475% of Kobe, the walls were not, were obviously the walls were damaged, but the, the roof didn't collapse. Next, please. So, you know, these are some of the pictures of the northeast corner, the top northeast corner of the, the wall, uh, of the, uh, the, the wall, and the southwest corner. So, we have taken two walls. The wall openings and the orthogonal walls without opening. So, so that we, we would like to see the ground shaking and the displacement and the story drift here. And you can see that uh, for 200%, 400%, 200 the, both the walls remain the same. The, the first picture, top and bottom, you don't see any extensive damage. So it remained uh, good for life safety. At 475%, the wall has collapsed, but the roof is still there. So it's not going to collapse on the head. So this minor retrofit, which doesn't have a serious impact on the cost of the building, this retrofit could be uh, has worked very well. Next, please. These are the these are the hysteresis loops that uh, we were able to uh, develop. And once again, 125 percent both the sides of the wall, 200 percent, 325 percent, and 475 percent. And this is a typical hysteresis loop for the buildings in here. But one of the most important things, especially if you look at these drifts on the right-hand side, that the drift on the south, uh, southwest wall and the northeast wall was almost the same. So we, what we concluded is that despite of the retrofit, despite of one wall having openings and the other walls do not have any openings, we were able to control the torsional effect. Next, please. So this is my lights last slide. So despite of that, because uh, the torsional effect was completely overcome, and because of no torsion, the buildings, the walls were able to withstand the, the ground shaking because they were not producing any additional torsional moment. Similarly, the out-of-plane wall, both the walls actually showed a lot of resistance only because they were bound together with the in-plane walls. So these are the two confu uh, conclusions, and you can see the residual strength of the out-of-plane wall was nearly 24% higher as compared to the in-plane walls. So the overturning effect, because of the Bounding of the four walls together has provided a significant uh, performance, improved performance of this Adobe uh, buildings. Uh, next, please. With this, I thank you all. My apologies that the two videos didn't work. But uh, uh, I would really, once again, appreciate if all the other participating countries and economies take part in this very important activity which we're trying to put up. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, uh, Professor Sharush Shalodi, for your excellent presentation, and especially the part, very encouraging output, the result from your experiment. The capacity, the increment of the capacity, you know, minor retrofitting is very cheap uh, retrofitting. Thank you again. Now, our second presentation will be from uh, Mr. Adam C. Abinail, Principal Engineer and Managing Partner, Abinail's Associates, Philippines. And the title of the paper is Seismic Retrofitting of an Existing 50 Years Old Government Building, a Case Study. Mr. Abinail. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, now. Yeah, please. Thank you. So my presentation is about uh, the structural retrofit of an existing 50-year-old uh, uh, government building, actually. And uh, this is a, an, an actual uh, project study um, wherein uh, we did some, uh, uh, based on the terms of reference uh, uh, as required by the government, um, we uh, came up with different schemes of retrofitting. Of course, uh, the, the, the usual, no? the traditional, and, and uh, before we lead to an alternative uh, re uh, retrofitting scheme. Next slide. <coughs> so, uh, as part of my presentation, I would be discussing a little bit about the project information, then uh, what innovative approaches that we used in this project and the concluding remarks. Next. In, okay, please. Go. Okay, so as we all know that, you know, our uh, FIVOX or the Philippine Institute of uh, Volcanology and Seismology has been giving warning to the residents of Metro Manila uh, with the eventual uh, movement of the uh, Valley Fault system, in particular the West Valley Fault, which according to FIVOS can generate a magnitude 7.2. So in this case, uh, most of the uh, existing buildings, uh, be it private and, uh, and government, are being uh, retrofitted, uh, evaluated and retrofitted, and uh, they came up with this project, uh, in particular the uh, DPWA, so the Department of Public Works and Highways, wherein they uh, uh, came up with this, the big one. Next. So this is part of the preparedness, no? And there have been a study actually in 2004 by the Metro Manila, uh, Metropolitan Manila Development Authority uh, together with the JICA and uh, FIVOX, and they came up with this study on what would be the, the, the scenario, no? In the event that this, the big one will happen in, uh, in the metropolis. So, okay. So, of course, uh, in this uh, project, uh, basically we want to restore and uh, preserve, rather, this 50-year-old uh, 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 office building. And, of course, uh, we want to uh, uh, somehow be able to achieve that uh, strength and durability and resilience of that structure. And uh, considering the uh, sustainability effort no, and uh, cost efficiency of the project, and how we go about it and doing the strength, uh, strength evaluation of the, pro of the project. Next. Okay, okay go on. Okay, sige, um, This is the, pakibalik. Okay, go back, please. Okay, this is the uh, existing uh, available plans. Yeah, okay. Uh, there are actually four buildings, no? but uh, I will be focusing on building two wherein uh, this is the existing available plans provided by, by the uh, agency. And uh, we, next, go on. And uh, as part of the terms of reference, we, have, we are required to do some uh, material testing, uh, the actual uh, material strength of the structure. So we have to do some uh, destructive and non-destructive testing. And then of course we have to do uh, some as found uh, surveys so that we'll be able to, uh, to determine the uh, reinforcement uh, of the of the uh, concrete because uh, there have been no no as-built plans available already, 
And uh, we have to do some foundation investigation and at the same time uh, conducted geotechnical investigation. Next. Okay, go on. And then, of course, uh, as uh, required in the terms of reference, we are to present three retrofitting schemes and, uh, and to recommend the most economical retrofitting uh, solution. Next slide. Okay, these are the indicative uh, floor framing plan. See, please, pra, please go on. This is the mezzanine. And this is the second floor framing plan. Next, go on. And this is the third floor framing plan, go on. And this is the fourth framing plan. And this is the fifth floor framing plan. So basically, this is a five-story building. And as you can see on the plan, it is uh, uh, quite irregular in terms of the uh, plan configuration. Uh, next slide. Go on. <coughs> See it. Okay, uh, please proceed. Next slide. Okay. So what are the innovative solutions that we developed no, during the project? Next slide. So we did some structural analysis and at the same time retrofit. And the analysis, uh, basically, we use the, uh, the uh, uh, prevailing code, which is the National Structural Code of the Philippines 2015 edition. And for the evaluation of the, ex uh, of the elements, uh, we refer it to the AAC 41-17. And of course, as part of the uh, requirement of the, uh, as, as, as uh, specified in the terms of reference, we have to do some uh, demand to capacity analysis, and at the same time, the retrofitting design. Please proceed. And of course, uh, uh, with all this, no, uh, we have to maintain in the retrofitting that uh, we have to satisfy that requirement for the drift of one and a half percent. Next slide. Okay, these are, as I have mentioned a while ago, there were three uh, recommended, uh, or rather, three recommendations for the retrofitting scheme. The first one is uh, considering it is a building frame system and that the lateral forces shall be resisted by the uh, steel braces or we have, meaning uh, the retrofitting provided here is uh, providing uh, steel braces. Next. Scheme two utilizes the principal, uh, uh, the principle of dual system wherein we have to put some uh, additional uh, shear walls as part of the uh, framing system. Next slide. Scheme three wherein uh, we designed it as originally, uh, uh, as originally constructed, wherein the structure would be a, uh, a moment-resisting frame, wherein in this case we have to increase the, uh, the cross-section of the members. So meaning we have to do some jacketing of the concrete elements and so on. Okay, next slide. And the fourth one, the reason why we came up with the fourth scheme, it is because of the uh, some challenges, no? I, in the event that uh, whatever recommended the retrofitting scheme uh, adopted by, the, uh, or rather approved by the government, then the, the issue there is the, you know, the uh, uh, not to distract, no, I mean disrupt rather the uh, operations because this is a government uh, office building, so they don't want because they cannot afford to to move out all the uh, occupants of the building and then do the retrofitting, be it uh, scheme one, scheme two, or scheme three. So they want it something that there would be a minimal uh, disruption of the uh, operations of the office. So in this case, we came up with this uh, using the toggle brace dumpers, uh, wherein we can uh, provide these dumpers on the facade of the building. Next. So. Basically, these are the key, color, key challenges. Disruption of office operations was considered. Construction should be limited to the exterior facades of the building to execute the retrofitting. And this is the analytical model of the dumpers using a software that we use in this analysis. And of course, all of the uh, uh, schemes were, uh, were, of course, uh, basically uh, molded using that software. Next slide. And of course, this is the, the parameters or the, uh, the properties of the dumpers uh, as, 
uh, as inputted into the software and so on. Next slide. And these are the production drawings uh, showing the patterns of the damper arrangement. Next slide. And uh, as part of the requirement, so this is somehow the, the, uh, the result of the analysis that uh, in the longitudinal direction of the, of the building plan, uh, considering the, the, uh, the maximum interstory drift, uh, without the damper, we are getting 6.88%, but with the damper provided into the system, we are, we are able to reduce it to 1.49, which is less than 1.5%. Next slide. By the way, uh, not only dampers, because the, the dampers were provided in the longitudinal direction, whereas in the transverse direction, we, uh, we provided shear walls. So this is now the, uh, the, simulate or the uh, uh, simulated uh, response of the building, uh, having all these dampers and uh, shear walls provided into the uh, building system. And this is in the transverse direction. Uh, basically, in the transverse direction, uh, it is the shear walls that are uh, acting to, lat to resist the lateral forces. So, in the original uh, configuration of the building, we, have, uh, we are getting a maximum uh, interstory drift of 21%. Uh, now, with the shear wall provided in, the, in that direction, we, uh, we reduce it to 1.38%. Next slide. So, this is the... Uh, the uh, animation, no? the simulated the response of the building in the transverse direction. By the way, uh, there were five uh, earthquake data that we used in the analysis, uh, and then we uh, performed the nonlinear analysis here. So as a concluding remark, dampers improve definitely no? the seismic performance of this building. Next. And uh, they effectively reduce the, the vibration and prevent damage in the event that this building would be subjected to a possible uh, magnitude 7.2 earthquake. And uh, they have a compact structure that can fit within the beam width. No? Uh, as I've presented here, all the dampers were placed at the external facade, so we have to do some additional framing uh, to be able to, uh, to hold all these dampers or to, to make these dampers in place on the external uh, facade of the building. Next. So they, have, they are, well, based on our analysis, they are effective uh, seismic retrofit of buildings and can be applied where it could be difficult to use the conventional techniques. Next slide. And uh, well, basically, uh, although of course, no, although, uh, uh, the, the only thing that we have to uh, consider this uh, system, although uh, it's it mentioned here that it is maintenance free because, uh, because they, are, they have been tested and uh, uh, as provided and uh, guaranteed by the uh, supplier that uh, these are proven to, to be uh, effective in some buildings and of course not only in, uh, uh, not only of course of, uh, when we apply when we uh, use this in the Philippines, but also in other parts of the world, uh, be, uh, especially in Japan, because the, actually the dampers that we are getting here would be coming from Japan. Okay, that's it. Uh, I guess uh, that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abinales, for your nice presentation. Our third presentation is uh, from JSCE by Kenjiro Yamamoto, Assistant Professor in the University of Tokyo. But maybe he's not there. Mr. Yamamoto, are you there? Have you joined? I think uh, he could not join. So anyway, we'll go to the fourth presentation. And meanwhile, if Yamamoto uh, son join, then he'll be, his presentation will be the last presentation. Now I'll invite uh, MD Shafiul Islam 
Senior Research Engineer, Housing and Building Research Institute, Bangladesh. And his uh, title of his presentation is Seismic Prioritization for Detailed Evaluation of Existing RC Buildings in Bangladesh Using Visual Reading Method, a case study. MD Shafiul Islam. Joint, joint. Uh, only to join course, sir. Yeah, what is an option? Yeah, yeah, joint. Yamato san, are you there? Yes, sorry. Uh, my schedule uh, said uh, 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 17 o'clock. Oh, yeah. Uh, there. So now uh, the presentation will be by. Uh, Mr. Yamamoto, Assistant Pro Professor, the University of Tokyo. Yamamoto-san, you may start your presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Can you mute, mute there? Okay. Can I start? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, this is Yamamoto from Megon Lab, uh, Urban Earthquake Disaster Mitigation of the University of Tokyo. So today I'd like to talk with uh, this kind of uh, title, Seismic Reinforcement with, uh, of CHB wall with uh, coating. Sorry, uh, currently I'm in the presentation mode, but the, the, there is, the panel is not like that. Can you see my uh, slide as the presentation mode? No. Okay, so uh, let me let me have a presentation with uh, this mode. Can you see my screen? Currently, I'm yes, uh, showing the my presentation. On display. Pardon? Uh, can you just leave it on display? Yeah, share and then put it on uh, presentation mode. Uh, yeah, uh, please share your presentation. Okay. then put it on a uh, presentation mode. Pardon? Uh, put it on presentation mode. Can, can you see the presentation? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so, uh, sorry for uh, delaying. Uh, seismic reinforcement of CHV wall with coating. So, uh, uh, this is uh, our target, the masonry houses. Masonry houses are like this, uh, composed of uh, uh, bricks, stones, concrete blocks, uh, small units, and with the joint mortar that is made of cement, lime, gypsum, sometimes mad. And uh, 60, currently 60% of the world 
population use masonry not only in Asian countries but also in European countries or America. Uh, so in Philippines, uh, they have uh, uh, they are using a CHB block, concrete hollow block. I will show you later. This is also the masonry house. So uh, even the uh, modern and the large structure, of course, has on its own structure part as a, uh, I mean, the column and beam part as a RC structure. But uh, the infill wall is uh, in high possibility they have a, a masonry wall. And the problem is that many of the masonry wall is uh, wall are vulnerable to earthquake. Even in the twenty first century, we have uh, some damages uh, because of the collapse of the masonry houses in the uh, earthquake. If you look at the casualties in the past earthquake, uh, 80, more than 80% are caused by uh, the collapse of the major houses in major earthquake for 100 years. So, uh, the, so the solution is, uh, kind of we explain the solution is the earthquake coating that is Seismic uh, retrofitting coating. What it is is the fiber reinforced uh, paint, and uh, the advantages are uh, in uh, divided into two. Uh, one is easy to use, so you need no specific techniques, and uh, you can reduce time and labor. And usually this kind of fiber reinforced plastic or something, fiber reinforced resin or strong resin, uh, including polyurea, uh, is uh, very, very expensive. But uh, what we do is just uh, mixing uh, any fiber and into any resin. So you can make it with the low cost. And the impact of uh, uh, this kind of coating is uh, you, you can use both old and new building. And uh, this is the application example in Japan. The, basically, this is used to, in Japan. We don't have uh, masonry houses, so masonry structure. So we use for the maintenance of the RC structure. But if you look at the background of the Philippines, then uh, you have a uh, uh, we, we, we have a uh, CHP block that is the structure is the masonry structure. Uh, small unit like CHP is composed, piled up. And uh, recently, uh, at least 10 times of the more than M6 earthquake occurs all over the Philippines. And uh, Especially this kind of non-structured part made up uh, CHP is uh, ha has the damage in the earthquake. So we have in the University of Tokyo also done the uh, this kind of target as a shake table test, and the top left one is the non-engineered. Uh, CHB structure that doesn't follow the uh, that is typical uh, in the rural area in Philippines and the bottom uh, left part is engineered one that is following the uh, uh, structure code in Philippines and uh, the top right one is uh, non-engineered one with this kind of fiber reinforced paint. So at last, uh, this kind of structure, uh, typical structure in rural area has the, even in the 
uh, non engineered one with paint stood in the large uh, earthquake, uh, more than engineered one. And also, we have done the uh, second, uh, the shake table testing, the second largest in the world shake table. I mean, the 15 meter by 15 meter full scale. And uh, that uh, model is following uh, the uh, Philippine uh, school case. And the input motion is the Kobe earthquake. The right one is conventional. The left one is conventional means that non-engineered. The left one is non-engineered with the fiber reinforced coating. In the witness of uh, DBWH uh, Department of ha uh, Public Works and Highways in Philippines, then we could uh, we were allowed to uh, retrofit the some schools uh, class of the school and after this kind of retrofitting uh, they have uh, several earthquakes and then uh, we uh, are re reported that they do not have uh, any damage on it we have also done the uh, coating of uh, in Nepal, the Darbar Square World Heritage, a kind of temple. Uh, well, uh, this shows that in uh, this can be e easily used by the local uh, painters. That's all. Thank you very much. Sorry, I cannot hear at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, dear audience, please get prepared for the question and answer, which will be at the end of the session. Thank you, Yamamoto san. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our last presentation. Uh, will be by MD Shafiul Islam. Shafiul Islam. Is it working now? Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Spirit Chair, of this session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, give a special thanks to PICE uh, for arranging these types of seminar. And then, uh, of course, uh, I'm very much grateful to IEB uh, to arrange uh, this TC22 as a co-chair of this TC22. So uh, this is uh, Muhammad Shafiul Islam, uh, member IEB. And also, I'm working as a senior research engineer, Housing and Building Research Institute, Bangladesh. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, seismic uh, prioritization for detailed evaluation of existing RC building in Bangladesh using visual rating method. And it is a, it's a case study. In my presentation, at the beginning, I'll just briefly talk about what is the VR method, visual rating method, and then application of this method. So there is an earthquake in the uh, last, uh, uh, last uh, decade about uh, uh, Haiti earthquake, Nepal earthquake, and also Equator earthquake. And uh, from this earthquake, uh, the identification of seismic vulnerabilities is very urgent. And uh, we need to set some strategy for enhancement of seismic capacity of these buildings. And uh, how about in Bangladesh? In Bangladesh also there is huge stock of mystery field RC buildings. And those buildings uh, might vulnerable or not vulnerable. But uh, we need to uh, prepare uh, uh, and also we need to conduct the detailed evaluation of those existing buildings for future earthquake. But uh, it's quite difficult because uh, big stock of buildings we need to uh, we need to manage 
So how we can manage within uh, these limited experts and also uh, budget and also time. Therefore, the objectives of this study was uh, to develop a rapid visual screening method. Here is mentioned a VR method. And also by using this VR method, we can set a strategy for uh, prioritization for detailed evaluation. And which is, which is useful to reduce the uh, expert's time and cost. And uh, at the beginning, the VR method is the certified way for prediction of seismic capacity by using simple parameter, for example, column area, mystery field area, and number of history, et cetera. And the purpose is uh, to set the priority for detailed evaluation. So we will uh, categorize the buildings, A, B, C, D, E, and by based on the VR rating index. Later, I will talk about uh, the VR index. And theoretical background, actually, this idea comes from uh, Shiga map. Professor Shiga from Tohoku University, and he considers two simple parameters, average uh, shear stress in column and RC wall and cross-sectional area of RC wall. And he applied this idea in Tokachi Oki earthquake 1968 and Miyagi Oki earthquake 1978. And he made this plot, and this is called Shiga map. And here, uh, by using very simple these two parameters, can easily identify the damaged building and non-damaged building. When based on this idea, but a structural system is Japan and Bangladesh is totally different. So therefore, we cannot use Shiga map directly in Bangladesh. Therefore, we made some modification, or we made some revision of this method, and then based on this idea, we uh, develop an equation called seismic capacity. Uh, com consists of column strength, mesh infill strength, and RC wall strength. And here, if you see, if we divide uh, this capacity then uh, by the building weight, then we can uh, get the seismic capacity index. And here, uh, if you see these equations, just very simple three parameter, column area ratio, measure infill ratio, and the RC wall ratio. And using some uh, basic assumptions of the material properties of those buildings. And then uh, this idea, we applied some existing damage earthquake in all the world. And here we have chosen the Taiwan earthquake database 2016, and number of buildings 53. And uh, this database is found from another research project from Purdue University and Tohoku University. There is another collaboration research. And the uh, number of buildings uh, is about two to three storage. And you can find this database from this website, Data Center Hub. And then we have calculated seismic capacity index, those buildings, and plotted in this figure. And if you see that, and that this simple equation can easily identify the damaged building and non-damaged building. So therefore, this equation uh, predicts well to damaged building. But uh, this, uh, if we apply this idea, existing building, we need architectural drawing, structural drawing. But most of the existing building, it's very, uh, unfortunately, uh, is uh, not available. Therefore, we developed this VR method. And uh, VR method uh, is calculated visualizing index, and which is based on seismic capacity index, and we I only showed these equations in the previous slides. And uh, here, VR index is uh, calculated by using these equations, and these equations is just simplified form of column area ratio, mesh infill ratio, and RC wall ratio. And since this method is uh, visual investigation, so therefore we can understand some area weight index and also time index. So, uh, so timeless is consist of the deterioration and yeah, construction. So now I'm going to talk about the simplified column area ratio, how to calculate. So simplified column area ratio is calculated by using two simple parameters, average column size and average span length. So instead of measuring all column size, we will measure only two or three column. Then we can find the average column size. And also, uh, similar way, we can easily understand the average span length. By using this ratio, we can understand the uh, the base shear coefficient of the building. Very roughly, we can estimate. And uh, machine infill ratio also uh, yeah, consists of machine infill thickness, average span length, and average and uh, machine infill ratio. Here, machine infill ratio can be estimated by using uh, two directions. So number of machine infill in x direction, here is two. Number of span is 16, so two by 16, and y direction is three by 15. Therefore, the minimum value is considered uh, for conservative estimation, and the machine infill uh, and the RC wall ratio is a similar way for the mesh infill ratio we can calculate. And uh, the, there is some reduction factor uh, for the erosion and also deterioration. You know, uh, these types of uh, erosion building is very common. 
uh, in Bangladesh and also other country. And therefore, these types of damage is very uh, is uh, shown in past earthquake uh, for aspect ratio and also open uh, ground floor. And therefore, some reaction factor is considered in this method. Uh, the Bayesian assumption also considered, uh, which is a similar to the PBS method. Here, uh, since this method is uh, the prioritization for detailed evaluation, therefore some judgment criteria is applied, uh, considered in this method. And here, building are categorized into A, B, C, D, E. And here, E means highest priority for detailed evaluation. And A means is least priority for detailed evaluation. We cannot say uh, this building is vulnerable, uh, not vulnerable. We could say just this building should go prior prioritizing for the detailed evaluation very rapidly, firstly. So this is the VR method development. And uh, here, the application of this VR method, in, uh, we, we uh, applied this idea in Bangladesh. Here, uh, this area we choose. This is the Dhaka city, capital of Bangladesh, and some area we chosen uh, for as a pilot piloting basis. And here, 1,020 building is uh, applied, uh, applied the VR method. And this is the locations of the building, and building are chosen randomly in this area. And this is the structural system in Bangladesh. And these, most of the buildings, three to six story building, and 91% is residential building. And here, uh, if you see, uh, after uh, 2006, the BNBC uh, is 63%. And uh, we, ha we did uh, two types of investigation. First of all, visual investigation, and then detailed in investigation. And for the visual investigation, we uh, used a common survey data sheet which is uh, developed based on our VR method. And uh, here, uh, the IVR is calculated for all those buildings by using that data sheet. And then this is the distribution of the IVR. If you see, if IVR is less than 2.2, then about 30% building. So 30% building, we should do detail evaluation immediately. But other 70% maybe later. But I will not say that building is not uh, vulnerable or not safe. So uh, categorization is about uh, the, uh, about we can see the categorize, A, B, C, D, E, E only 2%. So C, D, E are the most vulnerable buildings, we can say is about 30%. Then we uh, made some correlation uh, between the detail evaluation so that uh, based on VR method, we can say how much the, about the detail evaluation results. So we applied uh, about 20 building to, for detailed evaluation by using PWD seismic evaluation manual and set steps evaluation guideline. Both manual is developed by uh, Bangladesh government, uh, another research project with JICA, help of the JICA. And VR method is applied of those buildings. And then we, can co we compared this uh, seismic index and VGO rating index. So if you see this figure, VR index shows very conservative estimation of the seismic index. So if you know the VR index, you can understand how about the seismic index of those building. So you know, there are many other uh, VR method in the world, like USA and uh, Europe and also the other, uh, for example, New Zealand. So here we choose one famous method, FEMA 154, to compare with the VR method to understand the effectiveness than other method. So since in Bangladesh there is no past earthquake database, so we applied uh, uh, this VR method in Taiwan earthquake database and also FEMA method, Taiwan earthquake database. So if you see first figure, so there is very good correlation with the damage with the visual rating score. But if you see the FEMA method, there is good, but not good like that uh, VR method. So that we can see that VR method more efficient with uh, comparing with the American FEMA method. So this is the conclusion of this to this presentation. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Shohil Islam, for your nice presentation. So we have got about uh, 15 minutes time, and we can take uh, some questions or comments from the audience. Yeah. Please, please, uh, give your identity.
Yeah. Uh, sec two questions for the second presenter is, uh, uh, first question is uh, you choose two directions for the size force uh, retrofitting. One direction is the uh, uh, Tamba and another direction is the shear wall. Why did you choose like that? I want to know this. Is, uh, what is your reason to choose like uh, one direction is that uh, Tamba and another direction is the shear wall? Oh, well, basically, uh, the, the main uh, challenge that we encountered when we are uh, you know, uh, contemplating on how we're going to use the dumpers and that uh, they are in combination with the shear wall, it, uh, based on the plan, um, say one wing of the building uh, is actually you have uh, two lines of columns only. So in that case, when we uh, discuss this with the manufacturer of dumpers, uh, actually it's the, uh, it, it's the man manufacturer which uh, recommended that the dumpers be placed along the longitudinal. Because of the, you know, the, the configuration, it's very tight. It's, it's not, you know, it, 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 uh, the building is very irregular in terms of the plan. And uh, in the transverse direction, then that's how we decide that we uh, used uh, shear wall. So because um, uh, if we, if we uh, put uh, dumpers in the transverse, uh, some of these dumpers would be crossing some offices and, uh, and actually there were no uh, permanent uh, partitions in those directions and it is an open, uh, open office space. That's the reason why. And most of these uh, offices are are offices of uh, uh, key, uh, key uh, what would I would say, the managers or the uh, key persons, uh, personnel of the, of the office. Okay, thank you so much. My second question. Second question is, uh, uh, your office building is RC building, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, you use a Denver. Uh, Denver is a ST, right? Uh, uh, you, you told us the uh, Tamba is connected to the uh, facade of the uh, uh, building. Uh, facade is also the ST or the RC. And if RC or ST, whatever, how do you connect uh, for Tamba and the, those facade? And then facade and the building, how do, how do they connect? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, those are the uh, considerations when we decided on using this dumper. So it's not uh, one is, of course, a built-in, meaning uh, in frame, uh, within the building frame, and the other one is, of course, uh, doing it a little bit external. That's why we have to provide external uh, frame to, uh, to, to hold all these dumpers. And uh, in this uh, project, uh, what we uh, actually adopted is having a built-in frame outside because it, we cannot do it, uh, the dumpers to be within the frame. So those are the, the considerations when we did some... Uh, you know, uh, uh, investigation and inspecting and uh, everything about the building. So, so that's how we decided on, on uh, uh, putting all these dumpers as part of the system. It is an RC building, by the way. Thank you so much. And, uh, can I ask Paul? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, First, I think I, I, I want to ask, uh, I, I want to ask only two, but now I want more, one more. Uh, that is, how do you connect existing RC columns and then your shear wall, uh, 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 new shear wall, how do you connect? Well, uh, actually, uh, it's something that um, we really have to uh, expose, uh, to uh, somehow expose the reinforcement of the existing columns. Because we want uh, all these uh, shear walls, additional shear walls would be uh, we would be placed only along the column line. So, so it's something that you know we have to expose the re existing reinforcement of these columns, existing columns, and then uh, we provide the shear walls and uh, make sure that all the reinforcement uh, uh, for the shear walls would be connected also to the columns. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a question uh, to Mr. Abinel. And uh, was this building actually the retrofit construction was completed? 
<laughs> okay, how, 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 how could I answer that? But anyway, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bidding for this project was actually completed already, but because of the pandemic, uh, somehow there was, a, there was already a budget, no? and the budget was already there, but somehow because of the pandemic, the, that budget was used for another, you know, and then uh, it was the somehow deferred, the, the, uh, the implementation of this project. But everything has been already uh, bidded out and awarded to the contractor. So something is, uh, uh, it depends on the government on to pursue this or not. So, and uh, what was the estimated cost per square meter? Oh, okay. uh, I ha I ha or, yeah. Um, to get some idea yeah. of the cost okay, of construction. Uh, just to give you an idea, for that building, uh, the, the budget uh, as, as uh, released by the government for that is about 300 million. 300 million? Yes. Okay, uh, but uh, what is the, if we consider it like that, that for a new construction, the percentage of retrofitting, yeah, uh, retrofitting okay. cost. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, what is the percentage uh, of uh, similar uh, building, new construction? Well, be, uh, definitely, because, well, uh, let, let, let's put it this way. You know, this is a, a very vital uh, government office building. So it is something that we cannot uh, uh, consider that the building would be demolished and then put up a new one. But definitely, they want this building to be preserved and restored and eventually to be uh, earthquake resistant because this building is very, very old and we are based on our evaluation. Uh, there are already members which uh, would uh, fail in the event that uh, you know, this uh, big one will happen. And um, uh, as to the cost, uh, comparing it with the putting up a new one, I don't, it's something that you know, I cannot answer right now. <laughs> but uh, definitely because we made some comparisons with all the cost, although a little bit that dumpers would be a little bit expensive compared to the other uh, retrofitting uh, strategies. Yeah, it, it is definitely expensive yeah. than the um, steel frame basic. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, in that case, why actually you went for these dampers instead of going for steel yeah, frame bracing? Yeah, as I have uh, said a while, uh, in my presentation, it is because that they don't want the offices, uh, the operations of the offices would be disrupted. And they want uh, something that, uh, because they cannot, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, costing, in the uh, cost of the project, the, the cost of... Uh, uh, relocating the occupants of the, uh, the occupants of the building uh, was not actually included in their original cost. That's the reason why, if we would like, if, if we can consider another option, wherein the offices will not be disrupted and the people will not uh, be relocated because they don't have a budget for that. That's why we came up with this. Yeah, I'll. I'll um, we are also facing this uh, kind of problem. Mm -hmm. uh, in case of retrofitting, it's a very old building. It's very expensive. And what is the uh, percentage, the controversy, that if it is more than 30%, uh, okay. we should in, go in, for in new construction? Uh, maybe uh, here in the Philippines, I guess, uh, uh, what uh, the, the figure, the, 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 the number that we are looking at is if the cost of retrofitting would be about 60% of uh, putting up a new one, then they will not pursue that. Yeah, 15%? Yeah. 60%. 60, okay, okay, thank you. Welcome. Somebody else was trying to ask some question? Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, thank you. Yeah, when I saw the presentation, I mean, the, the building is a bit uh, irregular. Yeah. Hor it has a, a horizontal irregularity, quite significant, because you have a long and then oh, you have a corners. Uh, but when you show the vibration uh, characteristic of the building, it's very, very nice. What happened? I mean, like uh, you introduce something so that no torsions or so whatsoever. I mean, like, uh, or it is something to do with the damper that you yeah, arrange. Something to do with dampers uh, in combination with the shear walls. Uh, that's, those are the things that we look at when we did the analysis. I see, so that's why you come out with a very ideal uh, vibration characteristic of the building. Was it the mode shifts or was it actual uh, animation? 
Uh, it is an actual animation. Yeah, that looks like all uh, animation. Considering all those uh, the, damper patterns. The original patterns. should be yeah. a lot of torsion, yeah? And yeah? uh, you will note that in the in the damper uh, pattern, it is something that, you know, it's not, not something that you have a pattern. Because uh, we only identify those uh, frames or those bays uh -huh. where we have to provide the dampers. So it's not something that you have a continuous damper and then you have a pattern, something like I that. I see, I see. So, so And uh, most of these dampers are located uh, in the middle portion of the building, not I at see. the external. So that's why then that's you, you come out yes, with a very good uh, yes, dynamic characteristic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can I ask you? Oh. Uh, according to our suppliers, about 50, 50 years. Can I ask? Uh, I ask. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I saw the response uh, in. I mean, like when you apply, when you subject the building to 200% of the Kobe, yeah? And then uh, it still stay there, but when you increase to 40, 75%, percent, yeah? Then it's, it's collapsed, the, the masonry uh, part that is not uh, strengthened, yeah, by the... Now, uh, my question is, because uh, as I saw your, your uh, layout, uh, it's so compact, and then uh, you don't put uh, any ties elements around uh, close to the opening. So the, no, no, the, the ties element a we bit. Did, we did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, you also did the. Nobody could, yeah. Near the, near the doors also. Oh, near the doors also? Because I, I cannot see in the. In the yeah, it was there, probably I went through this thing very quickly. But I, know, see, there was, there was I see. Okay, okay. So, all right. Then that answer the, the question. Retrofitting is quite innovative that uh, you are talking about. Uh, and could you really implement this idea, the laboratory idea in the actual life? And uh, in, in master scale, maybe the, it, it is possible to do uh, this uh, retrofitting see, uh, in a did, master scale. It's a very similar, low cost. We did the similar retrofit. Uh, a after 2013 earthquake in a area called Abarang, and we retrofitted 50,000 houses, adobe houses, 50,000, and this project was given uh, one of the projects in Cape Sikang Valley in Tokyo. And the award was funded by there. whom? The government fund? Yeah, it was funded by the government. Fund. Yes, and uh, what is the just average the cost average per household at unit? At, at that time, the average cost was 300,000 rupees per household? 3,000 rupees per no, household. No, 300,000. 300,000. 300, and uh, the way the program was designed that it was actually first the survey was conducted and everybody was then registered, uh, those whose houses needs to be rebuilt, they were registered against their national identity card numbers and they had to open a bank account and one third of the amount of money was given to them which is about 100,000 rupees and they have to build it up to the plinth level or actually the sill level the window level, and then the second tranche was given to them to build it up to the roof level, and the third tranche was that given to put the roof. So entire, the entire thing was done by, uh, in collaboration with uh, the NED University where I work, and IEP, and uh, 50,000 houses were built. So we were part of the, uh, the training program, uh, of the, and this was not contractor driven. It was an owner driven initiative. Oh. Owner, owner did it. Yes. And w what is the percentage of the cost borne by the owner? Zero. Zero? Totally funded yes. by the yes. government? Yes, totally funded. Okay. And the total project and fund management, who did it? There was a full-time project directorate uh, in that region, and the deputy commissioner of that area was responsible uh, for that project, and w the deputy commissioner actually came along with us in, in Tokyo to receive the award. It's quite interesting because I want to know that management part. Is there any paper available on yes, that? Yes, there are plenty financial of financial. Yeah, analysis. there are plenty of paper available. Actually, the whole idea started after 2005 Kashmir earthquake, where the owner-driven reconstruction was done. And fortunately, what happened was that the person who was in charge of owner-driven reconstruction in Kashmir earthquake was then transferred to the other earthquake area because of his expertise, which doesn't really happen very often. And then because of his experience, he replicated this idea in the province of Baluchistan. It's a very unique thing. I can share the details well, of the project. Whether that uh, model is uh, being replicated subsequently? I pray not. 
because there's a heavy price. You have to first of all have an earthquake where it'll kill a lot of people, and then you're going to apply the model. So I, I would pray not, but if it happens, yes, it can be repeated. By that yeah. time, we forget. Uh, I certainly hope not, because in a span from 2005 to 2013, it was done twice. I hope, you know, it, the, the, uh, I hope if we forget it, it means, means something like 50 years. So, uh, I w I, you know, this is something strange. I've been doing earthquake engineering all my life, praying that I was wrong. Because nobody wants to, to have an earthquake. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And any question for Mr. Shafiul Islam? I, since yeah. I have the mic, it's not a question, yeah. but it's uh, it's a comment. It's really an innovative thing because there's a lot of rapid visual screening uh, mechanism and procedures available all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, and they are being extensively used. But this, they are the, the, the methods are really rapid visual screening. Mm -hmm. no, nothing really technical. Yeah. But the stuff that you have shown has a lot of uh, inbuilt strength, especially. Uh, the infills, because infills provide yeah. a lot of, uh, a tremendous amount yes. of lateral yes. stiffness, yes. which is uh, which is another addition. So I would like to compliment on you, you and this work. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, the, uh, um, in my presentation, I wanted to show this uh, book. Actually, this is the manual. So based on the VR method, we also prepared a manual. And this manual is uh, government already endorsed this manual to use in, uh, in our country, and also not only in our country, but also other countries like Nepal, India, Pakistan, and also Indonesia, and also uh, these types of structure is available. They can use these manuals by using their materials, the maybe some, uh, some little bit modification is possible also. Thank you very much for your kind compliments. Thank you. It is not a technical uh, question. Uh, as I get idea from your deliberation, and uh, guided by guided by Professor, Professor Lodi, uh, Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, Bangladesh is is very much vulnerable. These are all Philippines, Japan are earthquake prone areas. So. I would request to intensify your in, intensify your subject as because we, we will need more assistance to develop these systems in these white pro, uh, earthquake prone areas. This is my request. I am very much I am very much I am very much impressed by his uh, deliberation. Thank you. I, I also. I also echo your feeling, you know, it's not only the countries that you have mentioned, then we have Hong Kong, and then we have New Zealand, and then we have the west coast of the United States, uh, uh, in Indonesia, um, almost all the countries. Have, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, and I must compliment uh, Mr. Sigda's work, you know, he's been tremendously pushing everybody, and nobody seems to be <laughs> responding to emails, but I think we should. I want to thank you all for your active participation and I especially want to thank Mr. Dr. Park, Chair of ASIC. Uh, I didn't expect that uh, despite his busy schedule, he's here to listen to us. And uh, I'm very encouraged that Mr. Abinel has kindly given this presentation and Ms. Haki, President, Mr. Imran is there and also our Professor Lodi is here. I'll request everybody to cooperate more and interact and try to uh, exchange our ideas, not only through seminars, maybe in kind of field visit, encouraging the young researchers and the engineers of all our countries. Maybe we can try from our own institutions and maybe a little help from uh, ASIC for it's a kind of cooperative uh, study and workshop. With these few words, I want to conclude. And thank you again. Thank you very much. I'm impressed. Really?